Good morning, First Baptist Church family, and welcome to uh, Tuesday's Spiritual Reflection. As you can see, my uh, book line, bookcase, bookshelves are not behind me. Um, I'm having to record this live from the Strasser household today because, lo and behold, the kids are virtual um, because of some snow, uh, and here I am. Just when I thought that I uh, had grabbed hold of my long lost freedom forever, we're back at it again. But it is good to be able to join you for this time of uh, reflection as we look at the biblical text. We look at these minor prophets. Malachi is our uh, text that we're currently studying. This is the final prophetic uh, or actually the final book of the Old Testament before we entered this 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this is the last word that the New Testament writers get in, uh, at least to their portion of Scripture. Malachi chapter 1, we'll start in verse 11. We hit verses 1 through 10 last week. We'll pick up with 11 and we'll go to the end of the chapter, which is uh, verse 14. So just a, a brief uh, passage for today. Good morning to you, Glenn Fisher. Those who are watching, please respond in the comment section below. I would love to be able to interact with you. Uh, if you have driven by our beautiful uh, sanctuary, you will notice, at least if you've driven by since this weekend, uh, you will notice that in the planters uh, that those uh, old dead flowers that have, they were beautiful in the spring and the summer uh, have been removed and you can thank coach Glenn Fisher for doing that so uh, thank you coach Fisher but it's just wonderful to spend this time with you please say hello uh, uh, please um, uh, offer a prayer request if you have one good morning to you Brenda Kegley Brenda Kegley is, uh, we have a, a, a little bit of time here and I'll let our audience build. Brenda Kegley um, left me envious on Facebook the other day because she posted this picture of this scrumptious chocolate meringue pie, which is my favorite kind of pie, that was um, her Valentine's present for her um, wonderful husband. And um, did not indicate on Facebook that she was willing to share or even bake a pie for her beloved pastor. So I'm still trying to get past that, Brenda, uh, that image in my mind of this pie and not being able to get a piece of it. Bob said yesterday it was delicious, and he said he wasn't willing to share. So it is what it is. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 11. So before we uh, dive into our text this morning, I want to again remind you of the background. We don't know much about the book of Malachi. We don't know where Malachi was from. We, we really don't have a, a, a good time frame as to when this book was compiled, composed. Um, we think it was post-exilic uh, post text, so... Um, we have in this book um, the, the writer referring to the temple. So we think that this has been after the temple has been destroyed. So uh, Israel has been able to rebuild the temple. Um, and um, life is, is now centered back around the temple. So this is a post-exilic book after the Babylonian exile. The people are back at home, they're, they're worshiping in the temple, and at least for the, the passage that we're reading today and we read last week, it all centers around worship. What does it mean to, to worship well? There is conflict between Malachi, who's speaking on behalf of God's people, and uh, God. This is a, a rapid-fire argument, so they're going back and forth. God will speak, Malachi will speak on behalf of the people. And again, it all revolves around worship because the people are not worshiping well. They're not taking worship seriously. If you can recall, 
from last week, uh, the, the people, when they're offering their animal sacrifices, they're offering defiled animals. They're offering animals that are not fitting uh, in the eyes of God. Um, they, they, they're just not taking the act of corporate worship um, seriously and individual worship where they go and they, they bring their sacrifice to God. So this is, um, we are hearing uh, God speak. He is speaking this harsh word of judgment. He is giving them a good uh, uh, dressing down and he's saying, look, you're offering according to, uh, to Eugene Peterson, shoddy, sloppy, defiling worship. Well, God is in mid-speech, and we finished last week in mid-speech, and we're going to pick back up again in verse 11. God's still railing against the people. I am honored all over the world, and there are people who know how to worship me all over the world, who honor me by bringing me their best. They're saying it everywhere. God is greater, this God of the angel armies. All except you, instead of honoring me, you profane me. You profane me when you say worship is not important and what we bring to worship is a no account. When you say I'm bored, this doesn't do anything for me. You act superior, sticking your nose up in the air, act superior to me, God of the angel armies. And when you do offer something to me, it's a hand-me-down or broken or useless. Uh, do you think I'm going to accept it? This is God speaking to you. A curse on the person who makes a big show of doing something great for me, an expensive sacrifice, say, and then at the last minute brings in something puny and worthless. I'm a great king, God of the angel armies, honored far and wide, and I will not put up with it. So more shoddy worship, more sloppy worship. Um, the, the people claim to be honoring God, um, and, and yet it's God's chosen uh, who are not uh, worshiping well. Malachi seems to be saying, at least reporting from God speaking, that all around the world God is honored. God is honored by these people who happen to not be the chosen people. Isn't that ironic? It's a sad irony. The, the people who are not the chosen are honoring God, but the chosen beloved children of Israel, rather than honoring their beloved Father in heaven, refuse to do so. They say, I'm bored. Have you ever said this in worship? I'm bored, not engaged. And then they act superior and they stick their nose up in the air. Uh, so there's this lack of respect for God. And they offer these sacrifices that are hand-me-downs. Uh, Eugene Peterson translates the text. They're broken. They're useless. And God says, I'm not going to accept it. They put on this big show. They claim, uh, or they, they come to, to worship, offering these sacrifices that appear to be worth something, expensive, but they're really puny and worthless. And as we find at the end of this chapter, God says, I will not put up with it. So I posed this question to you last week, and I asked you to chew on this question. Well, let's just keep chewing on it. And the question is, how well do we worship? Because you, you can't read Micah chapter 1 or Malachi chapter 1 and not ask yourselves this question. How well do we worship on a Sunday morning at First Baptist Church? Uh, last evening, I was having a, a conversation with some of our folks, and we were talking about worshiping well. And I, I made this comment. I said, it's in my estimation that every time we gather for worship on a Sunday morning, uh, that our worship uh, is centered around the biblical text. So whatever the, the preaching passage and then the secondary text. So if you worship with us virtually in person on a Sunday morning, you'll know that we, we read two passages of Scripture. 
we usually read an Old Testament text and a New Testament text. Um, I only preach on one of those passages, but nevertheless, we do read two different texts. And the reason why we do that is because we're, we're getting, we're not just camped out in one section of Scripture. I love preaching from the Gospels in particular. I could stay in the Gospels all the time. But I also know that, that we need to have a wider scope of this Holy Scripture than just the Gospels. Because we claim that from Genesis to Revelation, that all of those 66 books are um, the Word of God. They have something to say to us. They're inspired. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit is working within those words uh, to inspire, uh, to bring us closer to the heart of God. So we value all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. And because of that, we don't want to just camp out in one area of the Bible. Uh, but everything we do in worship revolves around those texts. Uh, the preaching, uh, our prayer, uh, our um, song selection, everything we do. We have a very thematic worship, and the, the theme is whatever those passages happen to be saying. So my comment was we are a, a biblically-based congregation that holds scripture in very high regard. And I hope that when you worship with us, you'll be able to pick up on that. This is a church that values scripture. Um, and, and I think that is uh, an aspect to worshiping well. Uh, worshiping well is valuing scripture. It's uplifting the word of God and everything that we do within that worship service lends credence to whatever passage of scripture we happen to be studying that morning. Also, not only do we value scripture, but, but I think worshiping well means um, provoking thought. I think worshiping well uh, leaves people saying at the end of the service, um, we've had an encounter with the risen Lord. Um, you know, when you leave our sanctuary, either virtually or in person, I'd love for you to say that. I mean, that, that would be a, a, a wonderful compliment that you could give me, that you could give our other staff members, is saying, you know, at the end of this hour, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. God showed up during this hour of worship. So those are that's just a short list of, of things that, that I think... Um, should uh, be a part of every worship service. Um, provoking thought, invoking thought, um, having an encounter with the risen Christ, and making sure that our worship is um, founded, is deeply rooted in the biblical text. Um, you may have other uh, things that you could add to that list of uh, what it means to worship well, uh, again, I didn't write this list down. This is all off the top of my head, so it's an incomplete list. Nevertheless, those are the things um, that I think that a, a church should bring to the table when it comes to, to corporate worship. So let's continue to chew on that. Are we worshiping well? In my estimation, I, I think we worship well, but there's also room for growth. So what are those other things we could do? Um, I think... One thing that grabbed my attention and then will be done is people say, I'm bored. Um, I, I think that even in Malachi's day, um, there were some people who would come to the temple expecting to be entertained. Uh, th so obviously that's just not a 21st century phenomenon because um, this was apparently the case in Malachi's day. People would come to the temple. And, and say, what do you have to offer me in worship? What do you have to entertain me? Um, you know, our goal at First Baptist Church every Sunday morning is not to entertain you. It really isn't. We don't want you to be bored out of your mind and wishing you weren't there. But uh, we're, we're not there to offer you a concert. Uh, we're not, I'm not there to be a stand-up comic. 
um, we're not there uh, to put on some big production that's going to keep you stimulated for an hour. That's not our job. Our job is to um, help you to have an encounter with Christ Jesus. So um, I, I think another aspect of worshiping well is knowing that worship is about God. It's, it's not about us and, and trying to find um, ways to entertain ourselves. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this time of spiritual reflection. We'll pick up in chapter 2 uh, next Tuesday at 1030. Have a wonderful week.